All right, so let's get started. So today, what we will do is we'll look at a example problem and also start gears, okay? So, but the first thing we'll do, as I said last lecture, is we'll do this problem, right? So I just worked on it, and it's an interesting problem in the sense, I don't know, does any of you try this problem? No? So it took me around like uh, 10, 15 minutes, 10 minutes actually to do this right now. And as a student, I would have struggled with this. But that's okay in the sense, as long as you keep trying and you do logical things, it's fine. All right, so let's start with this guy. Uh, the solution. So first of all, let's see, uh, let's read the problem. In the system shown blah, the inertia J of the of radius R is constrained to move only about stationary axis A. So this is the counterclockwise direction, yes? Yeah, so looking at it from the, so looking into the page, this is the notation for into the page. This is counterclockwise. A viscous damping force of translational value Fv, be careful of that, exists between the bodies J and M. If an external force F is applied to the mass, find the transfer function G of S. So this is a very nice problem to highlight what I always refer to as the problem solving technique. And if you have been in any of my other classes, you know I love this book called How to Solve It, right? It's by Polya. It's an old book, George Polya. He's a famous mathematician. And basically he emphasizes four steps, all right? The steps are kind of obvious, but the point of that book is he shows examples of how to do this. So step one is we understand the problem. Step two is we devise a plan. Step three is where we carry out the plan. And step four is we check our answer. So basically we're still in step one, which is understanding the problem. So this might involve like, well, definitely involves intuition and uh, correct use of math and whatever you learned. Not only in this course, probably in other courses, okay? So let's see physically what happens. So what you could ask yourself, how many degrees of freedom does the system have? So one question you could ask yourself is, how many degrees of freedom? Answer. So let's look at it. So I'm pushing, so I'm gonna apply a force on the mass this way, yes? So what physically happens? What happens? Yeah, the mass moves, what else? Does anything else like happen? The mass moves. The cylinder rotates. Which direction? Counterclockwise. Is that clear? So how many degrees of freedom do you think the system has? Two. Yes, so there's no, not three, not one. Two degrees of freedom. Because of what we just discussed, there is X of t, which is not specified in the problem, if you notice, okay, and theta of t, yes? The mass moves, the inertia, the rod, if you will, if you want to think of this as like a long rod, rotates on top of the mass, right? So theta is specified here, x is not specified, yes? So now immediately, you should be like, okay, let me put an x here. Let me put an x over there, okay? And why did I pick this x? This is what, well, one, kind of not a good reason is this is what we've been doing so far, right? We've been putting the displacement of the mass, yes? Actually, it's not a bad reason, but it turns out that as you write this, and this is where you're, you practicing and remembering previous ideas helps. It's not enough. There's a classic example of where it's not enough. You look at me do it, right? So immediately what comes to mind is, so this basically implies and this only comes from experience, okay? And knowledge. So knowledge and experience. 
So if you don't have either of these, you're kind of screwed, all right? If you don't have both, I mean, forget it. So, so, so let's see. Writing this and putting the x here, look, instead of me telling you, let me ask you, what can I conclude from this? x and theta. I have two degrees of freedom. And this is, again, hard to think about, right? But try. I've written x and I've written theta. What's something that comes to mind? Yeah? Yes, that's it. Like Scott said, how are they related? So how are they related? Huh? Yes, that's exactly right. Scott's exactly right. The arc length. All right? That's how they're related. So in other words, as this displaces, all right, x, this is your theta. Yes? So in other words, if I blow this up, so here's my theta, here's my r, and I'm going to make an assumption that this is my x, okay? Small displacement, all right? So how are theta, r, and x related? So that's an assumption we are making, right? In the sense, if you look at this problem, we're saying, like, this x is not really the arc length. You see that? It's a linear displacement of the mass. But for simplicity, we're going to assume that x is the arc length. So whatever we solve for is valid only in a small angle approximation. Yes? Make sense? So given that, how are theta, r, and x related? Theta equals what? That's it. L over R. Yes? If one hint is, theta is in radians, right? SI units. Radians is actually dimensionless. So you have to do X over R. Because X is the same units as R. Yes? Meters. Is that clear? So this, you should know from knowledge and experience should tell you that there should be a relation between X and theta. And this one and that one, like, I mean, just have to have it, all right? Is that clear? Okay. Now, another thing which is probably not obvious, and I'll tell you, is another, again, knowledge and experience is uh, there are, there is both torque and, so this is rotational force, and force, this is translational, involved in this problem, okay? So how are torque and force related? So this is knowledge. So torque is a vector, yes? I mean, force is a vector. It's got a magnitude and direction. Torque is also a vector. Do you remember how torque and force are related from physics? So this is from experience, okay? So let me underline that. Well, you tell me how torque and force are related. So this is experience, okay? And this is knowledge. So how is torque and force related? No, that's just I alpha. That's a good point. But I want F in there, not moment of inertia. So some of the torques equals I alpha is... I is the scalar there. Alpha is the vector, right? But I'm not interested in that because there's no force in there. Yes, how is ex what is the exact expression? Because I need a vector, right? I just can't take force and multiply it by radius. That'll give me a scalar. Huh? Yeah, cross product. That's right. So what is... That's from physics. So is it F cross R or R cross F? What's the convention? You remember? It's R cross F, actually. Right. Because the one is in the opposite direction of the other. The cross product is not commutative, remember? This is important because... When we do a free body diagram, yes, because we have two degrees of freedom, you're going to have torques on this guy, translational forces on this guy. Yes? That's why that is important, okay? But we're going to make another assumption that since it's small angles, yes, the force, if you will, let me draw it here, the angle between the radius vector and the force vector, okay, that's the radius vector you want 
this is the force vector that's the radius vector this angle is 90 degrees so in other words we're going to say tau the magnitude is magnitude of r magnitude of f sine of 90 degrees okay because it's a small angle approximation yes which implies tau is rf okay i'm just going to go into scalars so these are if you will these two boxed equations are probably the most difficult part in this problem in my opinion right understanding this and that's basically understanding the problem okay now we can go to the next step of devising a plan which you already know of writing the equations of motion at the individual degrees of freedom being careful of the signs okay and this might be a little tricky there as well because it involves both rotational and translational motion but once you get this the other step will be a little easier right if you don't understand this you you can't basically in this problem you can't really jump to the second step which is device a plan you just cannot in my opinion i tried and it didn't work right when i was right before class i had to go back and actually well as i was doing that as i was writing the equations of motion i intuitively wrote this right but ideally this should be your first step especially when you're starting out in something like this which you probably have not seen before right okay so let's devise a plan it's just one line okay what where did it insert it before this not working there so I insert a new page okay step two is carry well, devise a plan and the plan is draw free body diagrams so let's just carry this step out so there are two degrees of freedom yes so let's look at forces on the mass due to motion of mass alone okay and then forces on mass due to motion of j alone okay is it called m1 or m i think it's called m yep m there's no m1 sorry all right so let's look at this guy so i'm going to hold this fellow still all right i'm going to see what happens if i perturb this guy to the right so what are the forces acting as i apply a force to the right there is this friction what else so friction is going to oppose this the spring the mass excellent the friction between this okay there's friction here friction here two frictions one mass one spring so i'm going to do uh, draw free body diagrams actually what i'm going to do is so how about this it'll be a good exercise for you to draw the fbd i'll write the equations all right plus um, so i'll directly go into writing the equations plus write equations of motion in s domain okay this is actually step 3 which is carry out the plan that's what this fellow is okay but anyway so this is at x so force on m due to the motion of m alone uh, like you all correctly said it's s squared m the mass plus 2 fv uh, let's see hold on let me write this consistently it's m s squared plus 2 fv s plus k times x okay here it's very important that you check the dimensions so this is equal to f of s 
okay so dimensions and signs m s squared m times x is basically in the time domain m x double dot yes so just to be safe these are forces and they are on the opposite side of the equation as f so they oppose f yes is that clear so this is the probably the easiest and this two you should not make a mistake like connor correctly said you got a spot that as i try to move this there's friction here and friction here okay any questions on that yeah all right so here comes the slightly tricky part you just have to be careful right yeah the d is here this is all in the s domain i just so it's ma plus 2fv velocity plus kx equals f of t yes huh so in the time domain so this is mass times acceleration of time so it's x double dot plus 2fv velocity as a function of time plus kx of t yes equals f of t no it's acceleration velocity and position there's no well okay let's make chris happy so this is x double dot okay let's write everything in terms of x he's right this is x dot okay same thing and of course unlike the s domain you just cannot take this out right it's not a it's a differential equation it's not a polynomial equation remember that's why we go into the s domain right okay so now let's go back to our little picture so what i suggest you do is from th draw a free body diagram right so i'll leave that to you as an exercise so you understand this so in other words there will be the mass the f will be going this way all three forces will be acting to the left that's what the free body diagram of that expression should look like all right now let's hold the mass till and move this guy in which direction first of all the direction of theta right so you're going to rotate it counterclockwise so this is probably more obvious actually now i think about it what happens to the mass it moves to the right yes so in other words if you write the force notice my or choice of word the force due to this the translational force not the torque right is that that's the trick in writing this if any in writing this expression here because what you have here is force you have force you don't have torque here you can't write torque then it's dimensionally inconsistent i mean torque unit is newton meter force unit is newtons right just you can't add them is that very clear but what is very obvious from this is the translational force due to rotating this pushes this mass to the right in the same direction yes so in other words when i write that expression on the left hand side i should have a negative sign yes i mean that's that's very obvious here but if you remember our previous problems when we looked at the interface between two translational uh, masses for example in a 2 degree of freedom system you have to understand when you hold one mass still and move the other one the spring between them for example if there is a spring actually pulls this guy yes it opposes the other guy the other m2 but it pulls this guy and in this case it's more obvious that's what i'm trying to say that this as i rotate this in this direction y counterclockwise look at the theta right like it kind of pushes this this way yes all right now that's clear we need to so and what is the um constant of interest like what is the interface between these two the friction it's fv that we want yes okay so what is the expression for this guy is it theta s be careful right okay so this is very tricky and this is how i do it okay so fv is actually a translational uh 
force, if you will. Yes? But what's moving is theta. X is not, technically it's not X. Yes, you need to get theta here. Because theta is what's moving. Yes, exactly. Connor's right. It's not, so theta is X over R. So what is X? R theta. Yes? So you see the subtle point? This has to be R times theta of S. Is that clear? See, the equivalent effect here is to move that mass, but I want to write this in terms of theta, okay? Because what I'm going to do is, if you go back to the question, is I'm going to actually, it's asking for the transfer function, theta over F, all right? So I'm going to eliminate X. Is that clear? I can put X here, that's correct, right? Because the fact that I'm moving that inertia is actually moving the mass. But I don't, I mean, if you want, you can put X here, you write the second equation, right, at the degree of freedom, you will see you can't really eliminate X, right? So if you want, you can write this as minus FV R theta dot, yes? This is the time domain expression equals f of t. Is that clear? So it is tricky, right? So that's why, I, and you should, that's why I told you you should try this, right? Now, if you want to try more examples, I think this might even be a homework problem. Here's one, right? We're going to do gears today. That's not that bad, right? So here is, uh, what, what kind of a gear is this? The one at the bottom, do you know? Have you played with Legos? What kind of a gear is this? There's a name for this. This one at the bottom. Okay, go up on the Lego website and look at it. Right? It's not a worm gear. It's uh, it's another kind of look it up. Right. So anyway, after we do gears, I think this is part of a homework problem. Right? So it's combining both rotational gears and translation. It's not too bad. Right. If you look at the physics. Okay. So we're not done. Huh? That's what they call it on the Lego website. Okay, Lego has a nicer term for it. I forgot what it's called, actually. Because I haven't played with Legos in a long time. All right, so forces, now, uh, let's see. Now we're done with the translational. Now we're going to go to the rotational. Forces on J, nah. due to the motion of J alone, all right? So as I move J, what happens? So as I move this counterclockwise, I rotate this, what's an obvious, so what What obviously happens first? Like, in other words, what do I have to overcome to move this counterclockwise? Well, friction is actually less obvious, which is here, because it's translational, but what's more obvious? Huh? Inertia, J. Right. So, because the reason why, okay, friction is obvious, but writing the expression for friction is a little tricky. You've got to be careful, right? So, let's start with inertia. It's J S squared, okay? Let me do this. It's going to be a theta. So, what I'm going to do is it's correct. I'm just going to move this over here. Okay. So, it's going to be J S squared times theta of s, okay? So now, what else happens? Let me look at my solution. So, now we gotta be careful of the signs, okay? Of this fellow. So let's first analyze this guy. Let's worry about friction in a bit, all right? Let's look at this guy. So this is equal to zero, all right? Why is it zero? Because the applied force is not acting on the rotational object. It's acting on the translational mass, yes? But we got to be very, very careful of the sign, all right? It's another point here. So whatever is on the right-hand side is acting in the direction of F, yes? The question is, as I move this fellow counterclockwise, does the applied inertia 
looking at it from the perspective of F, act in this direction or does it oppose it? Be very careful. Right? So I'm rotating it this way. Which way does the inertia act? That's why you have to actually draw the free body diagram. Huh? It tends to oppose it. Yes? Oops. It goes this way. right? J S squared theta is the opposing torque. Yes? Is that clear? So when you look at F, does this oppose it or does this contribute to it? Oppose it. Is that clear? It tends to oppose it. So in other words, I mean, if you blindly write this, it's actually a plus sign. But there's a reason why there is a plus sign. And in my opinion, it's you got to think about it a little bit. You just got to be careful. Right? Okay? I mean, if you look at what we've been doing so far, this, from patterns, this negative sign should come here. Yes? So this is at theta. But in my opinion, opinion, there is a very obvious reason as to why there's a plus sign. If you move this to the other side, which is the sign of, which is where the force is, it will become a negative sign, telling you that this torque is opposing this force. And it does, okay, when you move this fellow, yes? Because this torque only comes up when you move this guy, right? With respect to this F, yes? Because torque is a rotational thing. When this moves, torque comes about. This J, that's sorry, this J, that's when it acts. All right, so now comes the friction part. How do I explain this? All right. So let's think. First of all, this FV is a, it's a translational thing, right? But it's going to generate a torque. Obviously, it's going to oppose this. So let me just draw the free body diagram. So how do you, so I need a torque. Right, so let me see how I did this. Okay, so this is the friction component. So let's just write it out here. And I'm going to take some steps. So I'm going to do this in a bunch of steps. All right. Let me do this. Let me multiply it out. Okay, and this is the only way. I know of how to explain it. If you have a better way, think about it and let me know. So this is R F V. Okay? So this is just the torque. Okay. This is the frictional force that's acting perpendicular, we assume, to the radius. Yes? So this is the opposing torque. Now I want to get in theta of S here. Yes? So let's keep going. I'll fill this part in shortly. For now, let's finish this guy. FV is what? The force is S, FV X equals zero. Yes? That's the force, the translational force generated due to this friction, right? We don't want X. We'll eliminate that shortly. But the point is, the very tricky part about this is x is r theta. Yeah? So in other words, if you actually look at this, this is what I'm trying to say. S, F, so it's F, V, it's not r. It's r squared s theta equals 0. Okay? You can try to figure this out using dimensional analysis and stuff, but in my opinion, it's much easier to do this. And if you think about why the R squared is actually coming, right? If you remember your expressions for moments of inertia of different ma objects, they were like MR squared. Remember that from physics vaguely? So that's why the R squared is there. So, I mean, this is in my opinion. This is very, very difficult to miss the R squared. So if I were to give this problem on the exam, it would be an extra credit problem. So it's not something I expect you to do off the top of your head. It's not easy. But it's still a fun problem. So this is, um, so these are the forces. Sorry. These are the torques acting on 
this object as we rotate it counterclockwise. So this fellow is S F V R squared. Okay. All right. So we're not done. This is actually very simple in the sense uh, forces on J due to the motion of M. So M means there is an X here. Okay. So it is just so so as I so basically as I move M, all right, what are the forces acting on J? So in actuality, theta is what's changing, all right. So it's basically S F V. Okay, let me see if I did this right. R, okay, so what I got here, oh yeah, so Tatus, so this object's um, so I'm, ah, I'm moving X, right? So what are the forces acting on uh, this object? As I move this mass to the right, this one, F V here, acts in the direction of this F. Yes, that's what I'm trying, I was trying to say. So you have a negative sign here, and it's a torque. Right, so you have the R times X. That's what you have of S. Okay, so let's look at this again. The negative sign comes about because this is the forces on, gen due to the, on J due to the motion of M. As I move this to the right, this fellow tends to rotate in the direction of theta. In other words, this, oops, this force acts to the right, the translational force, which is in the direction of F. So when I write this on the left-hand side, I get a negative sign. Yes? And it's a torque, but the motion is on X. That's where I get the R from. Is that clear? So this is the force acting on J, right? So it should actually be SFV theta. But this is what I get because it's, it's X is what the mass is what's moving. So this is actually very obvious. So it's easier than this. X and then same thing, right? So minus SFV R X of S. Look at this minus S F V R X of S. So minus S F V R X of S. Okay? So here are the two equations. This is theta of S to be consistent equals zero. So that's the second equation. And this is the first equation. Okay, so let me zoom out and hopefully put this on. Okay, so if you look at this, erase this a little bit. All right, so well, let's look. Let's check for consistency here. First of all, you can see that this expression and this expression, if you write it in matrix form, excuse me, are the same. Yes, the matrix is symmetrical. That's good. Uh, so let's see. You have forces here, forces here, forces here. You have torque here, torque here, and this is actually torque, but there's no torque, external torque acting on this, okay? So now what I'll do is I'll let you finish this problem up, okay? So in other words, do two things. One is draw a free body diagram, okay? And number two, find theta over x. Huh? No, I can solve it. Like, yeah, you can just use these two, okay? So, no, okay, I can work it out. Okay, let me work it out. Okay, okay. So I'll what I'll do is I'll work it all the way through, and I'll so I'll put the solution up after lecture. I'll just work it all the way through. All right. So wait, maybe I've I've done. Hold on, let me check. Okay. 
Sorry? The, the only thing you can check when you're looking at both these equations is this one, all right? That these two expressions are the same because the associated matrix has to be symmetrical, yes? But you really, I mean, yeah, you, you could check that. Then, okay, another thing you can check, Scott, is you can check that this is force, yes? This better also be force because on the right-hand side you have force. And the torques you can check, okay? That's the second thing you can check, just looking at the equation. The signs to check that, especially these two, you need to look at the free body diagram. I don't think there's any other way to check it. Yeah, they are. Yes. So the question, the observation was, uh, these two equations look at the positive displacement of the mass. And this, yeah, the signs should correspond to that. But what I'm saying is, I can't see the signs without drawing the free body diagram, without putting actually these forces in there. Okay, so I drew one of the free body diagrams out for you. But what you should do is you should translate this expression into a free body diagram, this one into a free body diagram, this one into a free body diagram, and this one I already did right there. Okay. So I'll write out the solution. I don't have it actually, so I'll write it out. I mean, after the lecture. Okay, so today what we were going to start is we're going to start gears. Um, but what I'll do is I'll actually, uh, it's been like very intense, I can see. Oh, you're locked out? Tim's locked out. <laughs> so gears, I'll start Monday, okay? Because it's been a very intense lecture. I think your brains are like fried. So uh, what I'll do is I'll actually, uh, yeah, I'll let you go right now. I'll go back to my office, solve this, and I'll post it on. I'll, when I email you the PDF later today, it'll have a solution, okay? And actually, I just realized something. Hold on. <laughs> this is all symbolic, all right? So please check my work and make sure there are no mistakes, all right? What I recommend you do is you actually do this on your calculator or MATLAB, right? It's, and just looking at it, there are no numbers. It's going to be a little involved in algebra because you can't factor this, yes? There are no numbers. I mean, you can, but it's all going to be symbolic. Is that clear? So your final answer is going to be, it's not going to be very nice. Okay, so, but it's, so I recommend you do this on a TI-89 or, a, or MATLAB, but I'll, what I get, it's going to take me at least like 10 or 15 minutes to do. I'll put it here. Okay? All right, so I'll start gears on Monday, no hurries. And your next exam we'll talk about on Monday. I think it's next Friday. Okay? It's not, I think I, the syllabus says it's going to include gears, but it's not, all right? So what it's going to cover is up until today, okay? So electrical, tra so Laplace transforms, inverse Laplace transforms, electrical uh, transfer functions, mecha translational mechanical transfer functions, rotational mechanical transfer functions. If I give you, highly unlikely, any problem like this, it'll be extra credit. It's not going to be part of the main exam, all right, for sure. But that doesn't mean like um, the exam will not involve you thinking. We'll talk about it Monday. So I might not give you like, you got to think, right? It won't be like really just find the Laplace transform of this because that's not really testing if you're thinking. I'll, okay, to be more specific, there are properties of Laplace transforms. Yes, in chapter two, since we have some time, let me just, this doesn't involve thinking. So in chapter two, I didn't go too far. Well, I, I did go too far. There are some properties of Laplace transforms. So you want to look at that, okay? There are two tables. Table 2.1, I think, is just a bunch of Laplace transforms. Table 2.2 has some properties, okay? So I can ask you questions like I haven't made the exam yet. I can give you an F of S, all right? And I can ask you some stuff about it. Like, uh, oh, okay, here's an example of a question I can give you. So uh, this is thinking. So you know the Laplace transform. I already talked about this. What is the Laplace transform? This is exam related. So I'll just put this on here. Exam one related. So the integral of this is what? If I integrate this, what do I get? 
Yeah, I did talk about this. R of t. So if I integrate the unit step, what do I get? No, not the impulse. I integrate. I, it's a ramp. Okay. So what's the Laplace transform of this unit step? It's one over s. Okay. So if you integrate any Laplace transform, it's going to be. I remember I told you, it's multiplying by one over s. Yes. So Laplace transform of the ramp is basically going to be one over s squared because in the s domain, this is equivalent to a product of 1 over s. So what I'll ask you is find the Laplace transform of the ramp without using the definition. Okay. So you should know that if I'm integrating in the time domain, it's equivalent to multiplying by 1 over s, the s domain. Well, I may not, I mean, uh, this, yeah, I'll, if I give you the table, you have to pick the right property. Yes, like Chris said, okay? So conversely, if I differentiate in the time domain, what is the equivalent operation in the S domain? If integrate is 1 over S, it's just S. It's multiplying by S. Because differentiation is the inverse of integration, and S is the inverse of 1 over S. Yes? So like, stuff like that. So uh, conceptual stuff. So basically, exam 1 will be conceptual. That's what's important. It's not like, yeah, you need to find like a couple of Laplace transforms by hand. I might, that's just integration. Right? I mean, integration is important. Don't get me wrong. I might give you like one on it, but uh, basically it'll be conceptual stuff till today, excluding in the sense problems like these, that these will be, if I give you, I probably won't give you right? extra credit. That doesn't affect your main score, but if you do get it, you get points over 100 that you can use in subsequent exams, etc. Right? Okay, so we'll start years Monday. I'll, it's going to take me like 10-15 minutes to do this. Right. So I'll email you once I'm done.